There are many different religions in this world today. If you Google world religions, you will see that there are about 4,200 religions, faith groups, tribes, movements. All these religious groups claim to be the only way. They all compete with one another. In many cases over the years, the contention has been deadly. People have killed each other in the name of religion. From the sacred war from 595 B.C. to 585 B.C., to the Crusaders in the 11th and 12th century, the religious conflicts between the Catholics and the Protestants in the 16th and 17th century, the execution of hundreds of Christians in the 17th century in Japan and in China, the Mormon expulsions from the state of Missouri and the state of Illinois in 1840, the persecution of the Jews from 1933 to 1945 in concentration camps, all the way to the Branch Division in 1993, many people have died in the name of religion. But a day is coming when that will change. A day is coming where there will not be any religious group on earth. First, all religions will combine together into a one world religion under the leadership of the false prophet. Then that one world religion will collapse. This morning in our text, we are going to see the collapse of religion. So please turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 1, as we continue where we stopped last week. Chapter 17 has two simple parts. We see two things about the harlot. First, we see the description of the harlot, verses 1 to 6, and then we see the destruction of the harlot in verses 7 to 18. It is a very interesting chapter. A little bit of background, like chapters 12, 13, and 14, the next two chapters, 17 and 18, are also explanatory prophecies or windows for additional information. They are not in the chronological order of the book. The destruction of the great harlot of Babylon, which will take place after the seven bowls of judgment, the last seven plagues, seven plagues. Chronologically, chapter 17 takes place before chapter 16, the last judgment that we saw last week. So we are going backwards, so to speak, into the future to see Babylon, the religious kingdom of the Antichrist, being judged. In chapter 17, we see the religious side of Babylon, a one-world religion that will be destroyed by ten kings in verse 16. And by contrast, in chapter 18, we will see the political, commercial side of Babylon being destroyed. The great city, the seat of power of the world empire will, that will dominate the second half of the seven-year tribulation. It did not take long after the flood for men to be corrupted again. The world had been destroyed because the world was corrupted. God saved eight people, and it did not take long after the salvation of these eight people for men to be corrupted again. In the days of Nimrod, 
in Babylon, people decided to build a tower to reach heaven, not to reach physically in trying to enter heaven, but to get close to God, to commune with God. It was the birth, the beginning of religion, men trying to reach God. Religion was not created by God, but by men. There is nothing godly in religion. What is religion? It is a man-made system that tries to approach God, get close to God, be accepted by God by doing certain things and not doing other things. It is a system of works. It is a system in which man is exalted for all his accomplishment and God is minimized. Christianity is in direct opposition to religion. It teaches men to have fellowship with God, to have a relationship with God. It teaches that God is seeking to reach men. It teaches to let God reach men, accept what God has done for men rather than trying to reach God by doing things in order to be accepted by God. So Christianity exalts God and minimize men, just the opposite of religion. Today in our text, we are going to see the religious system being judged. We will see the destruction of the harlot and the end of all religion. So John continues the story. He says here in chapter 17, verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. We are not told which of the seven angels talked with John. It could be any of the seven who had those seven bowls. There were seven of them. Either way, John was called aside by that angel to see God's judgment on a great harlot. Who is this great harlot? There are two views concerning who the harlot is. View number one says it is Babylon a religious world system in general that opposes God and contradicts the Word of God. View number two says, no, it is more specific. It is Rome, the enormous religious system in the last days that will control the coming of a one-world religion. We will see in verse 18, it will confirm that the woman is a great city, not a system. Whoever she is, she will not be good. 
the angel said to John that she will be a prostitute, a great harlot, spiritually speaking. This woman will stand in contrast to the bride of Christ, which is a chaste virgin, spiritually speaking. In 1916, a pastor named Alexander Hislop wrote a book called The Two Babylon. The book is still available in Christian store. In it, his love gives the distinctive character of the two systems, Babylon and Rome. In the first chapter, he explains who the great harlot of Revelation 17 is. He said that it is the Roman church. He adds that she has actually taken this very symbol as her own chosen emblem. He explained that in 1825, on the occasion of the Jubilee, Pope Leo XII struck a medal bearing on one side his own image, Leo XII, and on the other side, the image of the Church of Rome. What do you think the image is? A woman sitting on a globe, the planet Earth, holding in her left hand a cross and holding in her right hand a cup with the Latin inscription, Sedet super universum. Her seat is universal, worldwide. John mentioned three things about this harlot. Number one, he said she sits on many waters. Verse one. The angel later will explain to John in verse 15 that the waters here are not liquid water, but people multitudes of people, nations and tongues. She does not sit on literal water, but she is over many people, multitude of people, multitude of nations of different tongues. She is very powerful indeed. She sits on the world, meaning that religiously speaking, she controls the world. Number two, he says in verse two, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. She seduced political leaders with her compromise and fascination, and they have become a part of the religious system that she represents. And he adds also in verse two, that people have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Fornication here is not sexual, but spiritual. This woman, this great harlot, is not a person, but a religion. She is a religious system. Spiritual fornication involves the worship of other gods or the worship of God in unprescribed ways, unscriptural ways. A worship organized by men rather than as specified by God in his word. Designing their own terms rather than accepting God's terms. This chapter takes us back to the church of Tyra, Tyra, that we met earlier in chapter 2 of Revelation. And Jesus warned that church, if you remember, the Roman church, that if she will not repent from her spiritual fornication, he will cast her and her children into a great tribulation unless she repent. God actually told us exactly how to worship him. We have to come to him through Jesus Christ. No one else 
nothing else. The Bible confirms that there is only one mediator between God and men, and that is Jesus Christ. His work of redemption is a complete work, nothing to add to it. So for anyone or any church to tell you or show you that there is another way by which you can come to God through Mary or saints in heaven, this is spiritual fornication. For someone to come up with new rules, to have a relationship with the God of heaven is spiritual fornication. For someone to put himself between God and man and contact God for them is spiritual fornication. Any religious system that proposes work as a way of righteousness is spiritual fornication. To believe that we obtain a status before God because of what we have done, our works, is also spiritual fornication. In our study of church history, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, we saw that very early in church history, the idea of having to work to get into favor with God was introduced in the church. The book of Acts, the letters of Paul, letters of James, letters of John, June, of Peter, as well as the letters of Jesus to the churches, all those explain precisely what the church of God should be and what the church of God should do. The church is not to exercise power or control over the lives of people. People are not to crawl in fear of the church or in fear of their leaders. Jesus said twice that he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitan, which is the establishing of a go-between between God and people. In Ephesians chapter 5, the true church is spoken of as the bride of Christ. Here, the apostate church is referred to as the harlot of Satan. Quite a difference. John was aware of what was happening to him in verse 3, even though he was taken by an angel. He was not in some kind of trance of something. <clears throat> he tells us exactly what the angel did. He carried him into the wilderness. And there he saw the great harlot that the angel had been talking about in verse 1. The great harlot is described as a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Who is the beast? Well, look at his description. It is the very same description as the Antichrist, the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13, verse 1. It is interesting that the great harlot is somewhat, somehow related to the Antichrist. This woman, this church, is actually sitting and riding on the Antichrist, the beast. Church and state reunited again as it once was. <clears throat> I have here a coin. Somebody give me a coin. European coin. It is a two euro. Euros are used in Europe. What do you think the image on the back of this two euro coin is a woman sitting on a beast. They are not ashamed. They are preparing people. This is what is happening. Eventually, that church will be riding on the Antichrist who most likely will come from Europe. 
Unfortunately, many churches today deny the basic need to bring men to salvation. That's the basic need of men and church are to do that. Bring men, bring people to salvation. They obviously are not interested in the salvation of people. They are interested in other things. Power, fame, glory, money. If they would be seriously interested in the salvation of people, they would seek God's guidance and they would ask God to show them how to do that, what to do in order for men to be saved. The Bible tells us that God loves the world. He is not willing that any shall perish. Don't you think that God would gladly guide them in the salvation of men? But this is not really what they are interested in. Thank God there are still some churches today completely independent from the system of men, totally dependent upon the Lord and His Word for guidance with no dominational political rubbish. The description of her clothes is seen in verse 4, and it is very interesting. Purple and scarlet. Purple is the color of Satan. Scarlet is the color of sin. Do your sin is like scarlet. These were associated with ranks. They used those colors for rank. The higher you went, you went from the black to a purple to a scarlet, and they used those colors. Decorated with gold, it says, precious stones and pearls reveal the tremendous wealth accumulated by that church. Obviously, that church enriched herself rather than enriching others, not even the poor nation of the world where she is. That church is not a giver. That church is a taker. How was all this great wealth accumulated? We are told in verse 4, by abominations, and filthiness of spiritual fornication, taking advantage of spiritually hungry people, selling them special spiritual services. I remember 40 years ago, my brother committed suicide in North Carolina. And my dad called me and he said, bring him here to Canada I want him to be buried here in the cemetery that we own for all of, of the family. I brought him to Canada. The church refused to bring him into the church because he had committed suicide. Now, my dad said, I still want him to be buried in our plot. The church forbid bringing him in that cemetery because they own the cemetery. My dad had to fight with them and pay $75. That's 40 years ago. To have a special dispensation, a special burial permit. They have made money by selling their services. Then we come to the name of the woman in verse 5. It is made of three parts. The first is Babylon the Great. The word mystery is not part of her name. Babylon refers to its origin at the Tower of Babel. That's where all that stuff started. Number two is the mother of harlots. And number three, the mother of abomination. This religious system not only calls itself great, but also the mother of all others. And the Roman church calls herself today the mother of all churches. So there are two Babylon. 
One grows out of the other. The beast, the Antichrist, controls the first. And then he creates the second. The religious Babylon pays the way for the political Babylon. At first, the religious system will support the political system. But in the end, the political system will replace the religious system. The religious system represents the Babylonian mother, chapter 17. The political system represents the Babylonian monster, chapter 18. So chapter 17, you see the mother. In chapter 18, you see the monster. Both get totally destroyed, thank God, eventually. Then John saw, when he saw that church, he said that he marveled. He was greatly amazed, he says in verse 6. That church did not exist in the days of John. But as mentioned before, John was now outside of time. And being outside of time, he could see what this church had done to the saints and to the martyrs of Jesus. He saw how much blood she had shed. There is another book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. The last chapter talks about the holy wars. When the Roman church tried to put down and stop the Protestant Reformation. The horrible things that were done, the blood that was shed in the name of Jesus is unbelievable. What a bloody history the church has. At verse 7, we get the second part. We've seen now the description of the harlot. Now we're going to go see the destruction of the harlot. John goes on and he says in verse 7, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. The angel tells John not to marvel in verse 7. And he explains the two mysteries, the mystery of the woman and the mystery of the beast with the seven head and the ten horn who carries the woman or who supports her. We know the mystery of the woman. We saw it. She is religious Babylon. She is the mother of Harlot. She is the abomination of the earth, verse 5. She is vicious and cruel, drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, verse 6. But the second mystery is about the beast. He was and is not and yet is. This statement is made twice, verse 8 and verse 11. And the angel says four things about the beast, the Antichrist. He says, number one, he was. He or the demon inside the Antichrist has been around for quite some time. He is not. At one point, he is not on the earth. Something will happen to him. It will be gone for the time. Number three, he says, he will ascend from the bottomless pit. That's where he comes from. That's his origin. We saw it, chapter 11, verse 7. And then number four, he will go to perdition. That's his destiny. 
We see that in chapter 19, verse 20. That's where he will end up. Some people say that this is a reference to five different emperors. Caesar Nero, who lived during the days of John. John saw him and knew him well. He was already dead at the time of John's writing, but they say that he will ascend again from the bottomless pit to rule again on earth. Apparently, in the first century church, all the persecution, this man was called the Antichrist, the beast. Maybe the same evil spirit that possessed Nero will be in this man, the Antichrist, but we have no way of knowing those spiritual things. Our spirit move from one to the other. The only experience that we have is when Jesus cast the spirits out of legion. He had many spirits, and they went in a bunch of pigs. That's the only movement that we see in the spiritual thing. Others say that it takes us back to Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, where we were told that the Antichrist will be mortally wounded. Somebody will attempt to kill him, and he will be dead. But he will heal, and he will revive. And John makes a statement here that is very significant. He says, those on earth whose names are not written in the book of life, they will marvel at the sight of the beast. They cannot be saved, those people. They will also go to perdition with the beast. John continues, he says in verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. I know we've got a lot of people with great mind here. Listen to this. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth king, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. And they will give their power and their authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are not with him are called, those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Now, for the second time in the book of Revelation, we are given words of wisdom. The first time was in Revelation chapter 13. A hint about the number of the beast being 666. The angel here in those verses mentioned 10 hints for the mind that has wisdom. Let's take a look at those 10 hints one by one. Hint number one, the seven heads are seven mountains. Verse 9. A hint about the location of the woman or the headquarters of that church. Historians have referred to Rome as the city of seven hills. There is no doubt about the place being Rome. First hint, the location. Hint number two in verse 10. Of her seven kings, five have died, one is now, and one is to come in the future. A hint about the rulers, the leadership 
of that location. That could be five previous rulers, Julius Caesar, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. Others says, no, it is Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. But kings are people. They are not places. Hint number three, when the seventh one comes, he will not last long. A hint about the timing of that leader. This particular king will be replaced by another quickly. Hint number four is beast number eight is the Antichrist, and he will be of the first seven. And he will go to perdition, verse 11. A hint about the root and the destiny of the Antichrist. Somehow he comes from the leadership there in Europe, and then he will go to perdition. Hint number five in verse 12. The ten horns of the Antichrist are ten kings who will have no kingdom. How can you be a king and no kingdom? Some people say that these will be ten nations of united Europe. They have no kings. Others say that... There will be 10 regions of a one world government that will exist in the last days. In a book called En Route to Global Occupation by Gary Ka, he talks about an organization called the Club of Rome. What is this club? The Club of Rome claims to be an informal organization of less than 100 people. Smart people, scientists, educators, economists, humanists, industrialists, national and international civil servants, no pastors. The club began in April 1968, and the meeting was in Rome. The organization claims to have the keys for world peace and world prosperity. The club has been charged with the task of overseeing the unification of the entire world. The club has then divided the world into 10 political economic regions that they call Kingdoms without kin. A map is in the book, and it says that these are the ten horns, the ten kings mentioned here. Still others insist that the ten horns are people, ten powerful leaders who will receive their authority from the beast, the Antichrist, and will reign with him, but shortly until the Antichrist takes over the full reign. Whatever the ten horns are, be it ten kings, ten leaders, ten nations, or ten regions of the one world government, they will be in one accord with the beast, the Antichrist. Verse 13, they will give him whatever power and authority they have, whatever he wants. <clears throat> and... Hint number six, they receive authority to rule with the Antichrist, it says, for one hour. Meaning, shortly. It is not a matter of minute, second, hour. It's a minute of, it is meaning shortly. They will have authority to rule, but not for long. Hint number seven, being of one mind with the beast, they will give their power to him. So shortly after they have some power, they give it to him. These three last statements in verses 12 and 13 are hints about the strategy of the beast. We know his strategies in these two verses. Then we have hint number eight in verse 14. 
These ten kings with the Antichrist will make war with the Lamb. Who do you think is going to win? A hint about their plan. What their plan will be all about will be to kill the Lamb. And then hint number nine, the Lamb will overcome them. A hint about the outcome, the result of their plan. It will not work. And hint number 10, those with the Lamb will be called chosen and faithful. Verse 14, a hint about the companions of Jesus confirming that when Jesus returns to her, his saints, the bride of Christ, will return with him. John goes on, he says in verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horn which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So here John returns to the mystery about the woman. So far he said that she is religious Babylon, the mother of all it, the abomination of the earth. In verse 5, said she's vicious, she's cruel, drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. In verse 6, here he explained where she will sit, where she will be. The angel explained to John in verse 15 that the waters are not literal waters, but peoples, multitude, nations, and tongues. Some people see more than just the Roman church as the harlot here, but one huge ecumenical world religious system embracing all nation languages may be all under the leadership of Rome. And that is very possible. Even though that church will be instrumental in bringing the Antichrist into power, once he will be in power, he and the ten horns, the ten kings who are of one mind, will turn against that church. Verse 16. They will seek to destroy it. The overthrow of the church will actually be accomplished by the beast and ten kings. God will put in their hearts to be of one mind, verse 17, and give their kingdom to the beast. He will use these ten kings to fulfill his purpose. He will use them to destroy that one world religion. It appears that this will be the only way to destroy her. Whoever will be left on earth at that time will not want anything to do with religion anymore. We see here the collapse of religion. The last hint about the woman, the harlot, verse 18, confirmed hint number one, the location. The angel confirmed that it will be the great city that will reign over the kings of the earth. Do not be confused. We have seen these words before, great city. We've seen it in chapter 11. But the great city there was the city of Jerusalem, confirmed by the following statement that where the Lord was crucified. Then we see it again in Revelation 16, verse 19. And the great city there was also Jerusalem, confirmed by Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Here the great city is not Jerusalem. Jerusalem will not reign over all the kings of the earth. Are you kidding? It is hardly recognized as a nation today. 
The great city here is Rome, the city of seven hills, verse 9. The great harlot, verse 1, who sits over multitudes of people, nations, and tongues. What a chapter. The Bible never tells us to believe in a church, never tells us to believe in religion. It tells us to believe in a person with a capital P, Jesus Christ. The church cannot save anybody. Religion cannot save anybody. Only Jesus can. There are men who are crooked and perverted in every field, every area of life, including the church. You will find some in certain churches. Jesus warned us to beware of false teachers. He placed the responsibility on us. It is our responsibility. How can we tell the difference between a right church and a wrong church, between a right shepherd and a wrong shepherd? Let me give you some hints. A true shepherd is interested in feeding the flock of God. He has a high respect for the Word of God. It is his priority. He's not looking for what is best for him. A false shepherd is interested in fleecing the flock of God and feeding himself, trying to get what is best for him and his family, looking for what is easy. The Word of God is not really his priority. He will do whatever he can to keep the people interested and involved so he can continue to benefit from the ministry. Therefore, beware of those begging for money representing God as being broke. God is not broke. We need his support, not the other way around. Number two, beware of those drawing people to themselves instead of to God. Or you must come to me in order to get to God. And they will hook you on their long, ongoing counseling, trying to control your life. Beware of those who will make you work for your salvation either door-to-door -door work, selling books, selling flowers, keeping sets of rules, regulations, rituals that supposedly will bring salvation. Beware of man-made doctrines or doctrines received from men or received from angels rather than accepting only what is in the Word of God. No one can come to know God through religion, only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away. It's a short thing. We will see it as we continue, but the Word of God will never pass away. This is really the only short thing, not religion. We see in this section of Scripture that religion will not last we see here the end of all religious group, the end of religious system. And yet there are many religions. We know many religious people in the world today, many religious groups competing against each other, but a day is coming, and it is coming soon, when there will be no religion on earth. First, the beast, the Antichrist, will unite all the religion as a one world religion under the leadership of the false prophet. Then he will unite with 10 great power makers and will destroy it. This morning in our text, we see the end of all religion. We see the collapse of religion. That was quite a text that we covered this morning about the end of religion. And if you have religious friends, 
Do you know exactly what we're talking about? They are sure that they are going to make it. We have family, Mormons. They are sure. They, they pray for us. They think that we're lost. And yet, I don't think we are. They base everything, everything they do, everything they say, everything they read on one man who claimed to have had a meeting with one angel. When the Bible tells us not to be deceived, even by angels. So it is a sad thing. I know it breaks the heart of Jesus that so many things are happening in churches, in religion, when he has not ordained that. He has not created religion. It is not of him. Relationship is of him, not religion. So I pray that you would focus more and more on your relationship with Jesus, not on a set of rule of do or don't, on a relationship with Jesus. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you who came to spend time with the Lord today. May he bless your home, your family, your health. May he keep you strong. And may he keep your relationship with him stronger than ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.